Hello, um, what a full crowd, we're very lucky. Welcome to the uh, 12th in our series of fireside chats um, put on by the Jewish Historical Society and uh, we're very pleased tonight to have Sir Michael Kaduri here to talk to us uh, and tell us some interesting family Jewish history. Uh, many of our previous fireside chat guests are here this evening and we welcome you especially for coming along. Um, for those of you who don't know anything about the Jewish Historical Society, we, uh, under the chairmanship of Judy Green, take care of uh, the cemetery to some extent. Um, there are, we publish monographs outside, you'll find a social history of the Jews in Hong Kong, and S.J. Chan's uh, monograph on the Jews of Kai Fung. And there are some beautiful cards which the Trust have kindly helped us produce uh, with pictures of the synagogue for you to use for any occasion. So we encourage you to uh, look at the books and monographs outside. Um, Jewish history is something that we feel quite strongly about, passionate, my American friends would say, and no, nothing more so than oral history. So this, the 12th in our series of fireside chats, is intended to preserve and enable everybody to see oral history of the Jewish people in Hong Kong over the last decades. So that's why we hold these events. Um, can I ask you please to look in your pockets and handbags, take out your mobile phones, unlock them, and turn them off. I don't think you need, I don't think you need me to say anything more. Um, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Sir Michael Kaduri. Uh, so Michael certainly needs a little introduction, so I won't give very much. Uh, he's a very private person, so we're very lucky to have him uh, join us this evening. He has a rich story to tell about his family. And uh, just like the ancient BBC radio program, he intends to do it without repetition, hesitation, or deviation. <laughs> <laughs> so he certainly doesn't want me um, asking him too many questions this evening. So uh, we'll follow a slightly different format um, this evening with Sir Michael telling his story. And it's only when I get the serious urge to become a nudnik that I'll uh, interfere and ask one or two questions. Uh, luckily, unlike the ancient BBC program, we have more than just a minute. Uh, we have an hour, and Sir Michael has agreed uh, that some of this hour will be taken up by questions. So I would hope that about 15 minutes or so before the end, uh, we will be able to introduce some questions. Ladies and gentlemen, so much. Sharon, first I must uh, thank you for the very warm introduction. I would also uh, mention that my wife Betty is in the front, and when she does this, it means fast forward, which she does reasonably often. <laughs> It's a privilege to be here this evening, and it's somewhat humbling because if I look around, I can see that many of you have far more to say than I do. I shall try and bring you just one or two recollections, uh, many of them stories from my own parents, time and the uh, period which goes back to the beginnings of Hong Kong. Well, perhaps to start with, I should mention that my family are from Baghdad, and two brothers arrived in Hong Kong in 1880 via India. Four of them left Baghdad, two remained in India, and two came on here. The two who remained in India worked for the Sassoon family, which my family related on both sides. And the two who came here, um, they're sometimes mixed up, they were both knighted, one was Sir Eli and the other Sir Ellis. So occasionally there is uh, confusion between the two. But Sir Eli was my grandfather and he went on to Shanghai 
very soon after his arrival here, while Sir Ellis remained here. Both of them were, of course, Ellie and Ellis, Ellie being, I believe, 15 years of age. They're very young to take this journey, but one must remember that the map of the world was pink in those days. Yeah. The British Empire <coughs> ran from Palestine, well, it wasn't Palestine, Mesopotamia, through India, and then on to China. So you travel without a passport with something called a laissez-passer, which lets you move around wherever you wanted to go. On his arrival in uh, Shanghai, he was sent up to Wei Hai Wei, which was in, uh, a little settlement, in fact, on the river, some three days' journey at that time from Shanghai, where he was put in the employ of Sassoon's warehouse people, he being number three. Well, number one was on holiday, and number two was away at work, and here was young Ellie left in charge. And bubonic plague struck Wei Highway. Well, there were deaths. There was a real problem in terms of maintaining health, and he opened the doors of the warehouse and gave out Jay's fluid, which is a good disinfectant, and those who couldn't pay, he said, look, we'll deal with this later. And in due course, both the number two and number one arrived back in Way Highway, and to his surprise, they took somewhat of a dim view of his having passed the Jay's fluid out without taking any payment. He was duly summoned to Shanghai, where his cousin, one of the Sassoons, was. And he said, now, now, young man, you go back up to Wei Hai Wei and we'll hear no more about this. My grandfather said, if that's the value you place on life, I resign now. He was also told not to be hot-headed, but he resigned, and off he went to Hong Kong. And he went to see his brother, who gave him some 500 Hong Kong dollars. And the 500 Hong Kong dollars, which was a substantial sum of money at that time, was what he really started life with. His brother incidentally said, don't come back to me for more. <laughs> he was an enterprising person. And he formed a partnership with two others. And they were successful in brokerage. And in due course, his success gave him the feeling that he might retire. He went to England. He married uh, into the Macatter family, of which uh, Willie, I believe, has already given a, a talk here. But the Macatters were Sephardic Jews who left at the time of the Inquisition in the 1500s from Spain and proceeded to Portugal, Holland, and England, where they became bullion brokers to the Bank of England some 250 years before the Bank of England was the Bank of England. So they were reasonably well established there. Um, coincidentally, we have only just discovered uh, in the last year some letters written by my grandmother in 1905 when she traveled, and I've actually put them in a little book and given, published them simply for the family. But it gives some indication of the times. Uh, very British times, might I say, very colonial, because the colonies, as we all know, were trying to outdo Britain itself. So you were more British here than you were, in fact, when you were in England. To the extent that you would be invited to um, somebody's home only after they had reviewed you rather carefully. It might be a month before you got an invitation or you didn't get one at all. And that would come with 
one of the servants coming forward with a silver plate and a card saying, Mrs. So-and-so would be delighted if you'd come and have tea. That's how it worked. And of course, if you were on the peak, um, you might remain a few weeks, you might remain a few months. But in her case, she was an educated woman and she did get some invitations. I can see Betty's about to ask for fast forward, so I'll try and do this a little bit more quickly. My grandfather did well. There were two children, Horace and Lawrence, Lawrence being my uh, father, Horace, uh, very close to him, uh, his brother. And I believe at the age of 28, he retired. He went to England, he bought a home, he put his two sons in Eastbourne at Ascombe St. Vincent's, which was a prep school, and he was looking to have a home in the country as well. Now, it wasn't quite pigeon post, but there was something called a cable in those days. Cable and wireless, I'm sure you're all very aware of it. And cables came in saying, do you realize your partners are not carrying out their work in the manner that you expect them to? In fact, one of them is an alcoholic, and the other one is not working particularly hard. But who wants to hear bad news? Nobody does, particularly Judy here. <laughs> and uh, of course, he disregarded this. He wasn't at all interested in not pursuing the lifestyle that he had in mind. However, the cables came in. And in due course, he had to return to Hong Kong, where he found his wealth had diminished, and he was left a little bit like this global collapse now, with 10% of what his fortune had been. Result, no house in the country. Um, I think the house in London remained, and he had to start all over again. He had to bring his wife back. His sons remained in boarding school. He did know brokerage, he understood it, and eventually put a partnership back together again, and his forte and speciality was rubber. Well, rubber was yet another commodity a commodity which was important at the time because motor cars were coming into their own. It was something where profits were made. However, like with what's happened just recently, in the global markets, the rubber price crashed. And as we all know, I'm sure we've got bankers here amongst us, the umbrella is only out when there's some sun. As soon as there's a little rain, the overdraft is called. And he was with a chartered bank, and of course his overdraft was called because it was secured on his rubber shares. Looking very miserable, he was sitting in Statute Square with his head down when somebody patted him on the back and said, Now, young Kaduri, why are you looking so miserable? And without even looking up, he said, Well, you know, if all your interests were in rubber and rubber has crashed and your banker has asked for your overdraft to be withdrawn you'd also look miserable well the person who patted him on the back was sir thomas and i've forgotten his second name but it'll come back who was the chief executive of the hong kong Shanghai Bank, and he said, haven't you heard there's another bank? <laughs> His statue, incidentally, is, is, is Jackson. No, Jackson, Jackson, exactly, Sir so Thomas Jackson, to which within two days he had another overdraft, he had paid off the chartered <laughs> bank, and uh, he was on his way to at least having the umbrella put back on for his head. So Thomas said to him, you know, we've got 3,000 people in the same boat, and we are not people who want to be in the rubber industry. 
is there anything you can do for them? To which his reply was, I am just a small person within this framework. With your backing, there are things that can be done. Now you can imagine a Sephardic Jew who didn't speak English clearly. His first language, incidentally, after Arabic, was French, because Palestine, as it became, it was at first a French protectorate and then English. So in that atmosphere, first of all, Jackson must have had a certain amount of confidence. And uh, I guess my grandpa must have had a certain amount of chutzpah. <laughs> Whatever. He was backed. They closed 300 rubber companies, which incidentally paid directors. Uh, they had directors free lunches. Cables came every day. And so this didn't go down particularly well in the community. They brought them down to three companies, the bank, through, I guess, my grandfather's knowledge in the rubber world. One was amalgamated, the other was rubber trusts. I can't remember what the third one was. And they lived through the 18 months of lean period, and of course, in due course, the rubber ball, which had bounced, bounced higher. He made his fortune, and uh, Fortunately for him, he diversified. <laughs> so here we are now uh, with a, a, a person who's beginning. And remember, Hong Kong was very tiny at that time. So all the companies that you hear of today were little seeds. The Wharf Company, the Dockyards, Kalu Wampo Dock, Dockyard, certificate number one if you look at the registry. China Light didn't exist. Um, they, were, they were all tiny seeds that didn't require huge amounts of funds. My grandfather went back to Shanghai, established himself there. Uh, he got into many things from gas to uh, land, etc., etc. And tragedy stuck. Uh, 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 struck uh, in his home, unfortunately, the house caught fire, and uh, my grandmother, who had come out of the house, went back in to get the nanny, and the nanny was out of the house. My grandmother was suffocating. My grandfather never remarried. He had, of course, his faithful lieutenant in the form of my father. And uh, he was with him virtually as an ADC all his life. My father said in some ways that he had lost his youth simply because his obligation and responsibilities were to his father. Horace was a bachelor, and eventually they established in uh, uh, Hong Kong an office which grew more in terms of the work which my grandfather had established later, i.e. it was not rubber, but it was in various diversifications. Meanwhile, my great uncle had died, and his interests went across to his brother. Those included Hong Kong Shanghai Hotels, the oldest hotel company in Asia, 1865, and of course, the germinations of China Light, which was uh, the Canton Fire and Light Company, which in 1898 sold electricity from Xiamin to the warlords in Canton. <coughs> Unfortunately, they didn't get paid, so they wound it up came to Hong Kong, and in 1902, China Light started. Those were the beginnings. Well, you haven't prodded me yet, but uh, I guess I'd better look at the time. If we move through those years, Shanghai was considered, and many of you here are with a background of Shanghai, 
So particularly you, Vivian, you know it all, so I won't tell you about those days. But if I could summarize, it was where huge wealth was made and huge opportunities were available, but the poor were very poor. They came into the city in the morning, in the winter, the dead were taken off the road. Everyone saw Shanghai as a city of opportunity. It was variously described as the Paris of the East. Uh, it was the third largest city in the world at the time. It had the second largest airline in the time, CNAC, which was, of course, American-backed. It was a city with international settlements built first from the British and the French, which uh, the American, which became the, the international, there was a French settlement. It was truly an entrepreneur place with opportunities. Jewish people do well with opportunities, and you'll, of course, be very aware of the Sassoons, the Hardoons, my own family, and many, many others. Yours, Michael, who was there. Um, it was a place where huge fortunes were made and lost. War clouds were gathering. Europe, with Germany on the rise, brought refugees in huge numbers, specifically Jews, who came via Russia, and of course Shigemitsu, who was very well known in giving stamps to Japanese, uh, to bring people through, Jewish people, into Shanghai. Horace, my uncle, was effectively the person who looked after the charitable interests of the family. Um, my father and uncle only had one account. They made the money together, and Horace really looked after this issue. He built two schools, one for the refugees, which the Japanese eventually took down. And not to be uh, uh, defeated in this, he built a second school. And uh, to my horror, as I'm an old car buff, he <coughs> took the long wheelbase Rolls Royce, removed the body, and put a bus body on it for the children <laughs> of the school. <laughs> However, that's another story. I <coughs> I won't uh, digress, we never found the car. Um, the Japanese, who my grandfather used to spend his time in Europe, in Malaya, where he still had some interests in rubber, and he would also take the route back through Japan and across Canada to uh, England. And in this, he was a person who spent time in Japan, in Chisenji, in some of the areas there. He also was involved in charities in Japan. I mention this simply in the way he was treated during the war. War came. He happened to be in Hong Kong at the time. I did forget to mention also that he lived Pretty much his principal residence was Marble Hall, which was the house which was built after the house which had burnt down. It was built on the property of the Jewish club, which was in financial difficulties, and he was away at the time when it was being built. The architect by the name of Grand had very grand ideas. Uh, when he arrived back, the architect was in hospital with DTs, uh, an alcoholic. This place was 220 foot long. Uh, it had 12 bedrooms upstairs, a ballroom which would take 3,000 people, and it took me some time to pedal my car from one end of the balcony to the other. Three people rattled around there uh, when they were together, because my father was usually here at the time, and last of all, the dining room table took 42 people when shortened and 72 when extended. It's now a school. <laughs> My grandfather was here in 1941 with now my parents, my sister Rita and myself. 
I was six months old at the time, and the same day as war broke up in Hawaii, the six, I believe, uh, it was the six, if I remember rightly, of September, uh, at the same time here, I may have got that date wrong, at the same time here, the Japanese uh, bombed December, it was, sorry, I'm getting corrections over on the left. Um, the Japanese bombed Wake Island, they bombed Hong Kong, they bombed Sumatra, the oil areas. This was a collective effort. And on the 25th of December, Hong Kong <coughs> fell after a rather <coughs> severe uh, um, warfare which was doomed to failure. The Canadians with their guns uh, arrived here, they only had their rifles. All their heavy armaments were shipped to Singapore by mistake. Churchill said, defend Hong Kong with a view in his mind that Singapore would survive. People were literally annihilated. And when Hong Kong surrendered, we were put into Stanley Camp and with my grandfather. And there we were for some six months before the Japanese officer in charge came and saw my father and said, uh, you are a Canadian, to which my father said he wasn't. You are a journalist, to which he added he, he wasn't a journalist either. All Canadian journalists will now go to Shanghai, of which about, I think, 20 people were rounded out. On a ship which was capable of normally carrying 600, there were 3,000 on board. We had a little cabin of which uh, my father gave up uh, his uh, area in the cabin to some ladies and uh, he was in the hold with everybody else. The journey took 10 days, the ship zigzagging to avoid American submarines with the Japanese keeping the uh, battens down on the top of the the area, so you could only come up at night to, to get air. We were then transferred to Chape Camp, but my grandfather, and I believe when we go back now to his period in Japan, for some reason they singled him out in, in, in a way that they thought was good. Uh, they locked him up in the stables of Marble Hall, where there was no food coming in, and they said one person can join you, and that was, of course, my uncle, who was a bachelor, Horace. And they lived in the stables of the house. We were in Chape. There was no food there, although there were some medical supplies that did, did get in, and good Chinese friends did bring in the uh, food for them. My grandfather died of prostate cancer in 1944 in the house. Uh, my father, asked, and quite extraordinary under wartime conditions, uh, to be able to bury my, his father and to take him back into his home, which the Japanese allowed. So my father was able to take my grandfather into Marble Hall and then he was buried. And soon thereafter, we were then interned in the house. Now the house as perceived by the Japanese was a very grand place. So they protected it and they had guards outside all around the place. They put wood across the marble floors and they had in mind that when they won the war, it would be a home for the puppet governor that they would install, Wang Ching Wei, and that was what it was reserved for. Well, whilst my father was in the house, the Japanese instantly were very regimented, they were very much like the Germans, and before the war everything in the house had to be surrendered, and you might remember some of this of Shanghai, and the Japanese gave little tickets uh, just as receipts. All radios, cars, anything that you might have, the place was gutted. However, there was one short way of radio in a piece of furniture. My father knew where it was, and he would go down late at night and he would operate this radio very quietly 
which he would have been in very serious trouble if anybody had known this. And of course he heard of the dropping of the bomb. It wasn't noted as a nuclear bomb, it was noted as a bomb that would change history. Six months later, uh, well, not even six months later, two or three months later, that was it, finished. The war was over, and of course his house was well preserved, so it became Allied headquarters. The surrendering uh, of the Japanese forces left a vacuum. Um, this was filled by the liberating forces. Commander Shoemaker, US Navy, came to liberate the camps. Uh, Ogden, the British consul, was there. Everybody was in the house. And my mother, who was somewhat shy, was encouraged by my father to play the piano. You can imagine the euphoria. Uh, there were GIs who had crossed the Pacific. And the most extraordinary thing has just happened to me. Uh, they are all too young to know what a B-29 is, but it was the bomber that dropped the bomb on uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And it was a tragedy that after, immediately after the war, these bombers from Tinian and Saipan came over to drop food in the camps, and there were people killed in the camps because the parachutes didn't open, they dropped it low, and they would go out and they were killed. But the um, uh, history uh, in that time of, of the liberating people was it was a mishmash of everyone. Uh, a man by the name of Bostick was a private and he would take me up to bed on his shoulders and he was my B-29. And three months ago I learned that Bostick was still alive. He was somewhere near Mississippi I was given his phone number and I rang him. And I said, you won't know me, but you might just remember my parents, so I gave the names. Uh, and he said, not only do I remember them, but they were extraordinarily kind to me in that immediate post-war period when I was so lonely and I was 18 years of old on the wrong side of the Pacific. And even when I was put into barracks, your mother would ring and ask me to come for a curry lunch. This became somewhat of a Kaduri tradition. Well, Hong Kong had 600,000 people. Pre-war, 1.5 million. The place was destroyed. The Peninsula Hotel uh, had been the Japanese headquarters. Uh, the Veranda restaurant was where the surrender in Kowloon took place, the surrender in Hong Kong in Government House, and we've had to edit our film of the hotel simply because there are some film clips of Japanese at the end of a bay bayonet with a Tommy holding the bayonet and pushing them out of the hotel. That was actually within the history and being shown in the hotel until a few years ago and I felt that 30% of our guests were Japanese. <laughs> one of the, uh, one of the ironies of these periods are the kind of people who appear. A Royal Air Force Halifax complete with crew Red Morgan, the captain, age 21, and the crew going down to age 18, were in this house with no orders. My grand, my great aunt would tap a barometer and say, boys, you can go out now and exercise that airplane. Well, one of the things, of course, my father wanted to do was to come back to Hong Kong. And so one day he said, could you give me a lift? And they, of course, were delighted to fly this four-engine bomber. They had absolutely no orders for some four months. So off they went. They said, do you mind if you uh, sit in the tail turret, the, the seat? You know, we don't have any seats. He said, no, I'll go anywhere you want. So he sat in the tail turret. But there was fog in Hong Kong, and the, car, and the aircraft went to Kunming. <laughs> in Kunming, as he was exiting this tail turret, he unfortunately 
cut his only pair of trousers. Left on the runway, a jeep appeared with two GIs, and my father wasn't looking too happy, and they inquired why he was looking so unhappy, and he said, if you only had one pair of trousers and they're destroyed, you would also look unhappy. A little bit of shades of my grandfather here. Within three or four minutes, he was a GI for Tom. <laughs> so, they dressed him up, and he said, now how do I get to Hong Kong? And they said, we can't help you, but if you want, we'll take you over to the other side of the airfield, and the Royal Air Force are over there, they may be able to help. To which he appealed, and the Royal Air Force said, we're very sorry, there is uh, no passengers going up there, um, we don't have any passenger seats, we don't have a plane for that. So my father said, do you have any cargo planes? Can I go as cargo? And they said, oh, yeah, you want to go as cargo? Fine. So he arrived in Hong Kong, the first civilian back, sitting on a pile of banknotes. <laughs> These banknotes were, of course, to replace the Japanese printed uh, uh, money, which was then taken out of circulation. My father's first, uh, his first, the first thing he wanted to do was to get down to the power station. There were prisoners of war, our uh, management, who had come out, Russians and others, who were already at the power station. The Japanese had managed to get one turbine operating. And that was for Hong Kong and Kowloon, and they had strung a cable across, and one boiler was operating. They had broken the whole of the front of the boiler and were shoveling wood, which was being collected off the hillside and put into this boiler. By the time my father got there, the boiler wasn't working. However, there were people like Eugene Joff, who had been a manager. They were all there working to try and get electricity to, in, to get, get supply back on. They required a Royal Navy submarine to come alongside, which in fact was needed to provide the first bit of electricity, which got the water pumps going, and then they were able to go uh, get things going. My father and uncle said, that only within the six months ensuing did everyone work extraordinarily hard to make Hong Kong get back on its feet. He said after that, people took their own interests at, ha at hand. Uh, one of those own interests, might I say, was my uncle was on a board uh, of which was convening military equipment, whereby the United States uh, armed forces were prepared to give everything they had in this part of South China to Hong Kong to get Hong Kong on its feet, such as bulldozers, trucks, etc., 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 for one US dollar. But there were others on this board who had interest in selling Ford trucks and Dodge Jeeps and so on and so forth, and it didn't go through. That would have got Hong Kong on its feet immediately. Um, but it didn't happen. And there wasn't the possibility of immediately getting trucks or bulldozers here, so it delayed everything for a year and a half. Okay, I can see fast forward is on. So I'll keep moving. At this stage, I mean, could you tell people what post-war Hong Kong was like for you? Where, where were you living at that time with your family? I, I'll tell you all about that in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> I was still in Shanghai. I didn't come back until 1946 on a DC-3 Dakota, of which all the seats looked inwards because it was for parachute purposes. And unfortunately, a lot of people were being sick, so you kept your feet. <laughs> when it landed, might I say, it had a tailwheel, so... <laughs> but let's go back to Hong Kong in those days. And that's what I think is what you're looking for. It required extraordinary courage to think in terms of a future for a place as desolate as Hong Kong was at that time. My family came back here in 1948. We were initially in the Peninsula Hotel, the house which we had been in was bombed. My father was thinking of building a new house 
on the peak, but all the family interests were in Kowloon. The electricity, the hotel company, a house which he had built for his father, Boulder Lodge, which had been destroyed, had to be rebuilt. So we went to live in Kaduri Avenue, which was a family estate, which had been maintained by the Japanese because they had billeted people near it, and so it was in reasonably good condition. <coughs> Electricity came back to Hong Kong, and soon thereafter, 1948, we have, of course, communism in China, and virtually anybody who had anything there, they lost it all. I can speak here because I know many of you came out with very little. My family came out with one carpet and six brandy glasses, and that was it. Everything else was lost. However, there was a lot of friendships there, and one of the friendships was with Y.C. Wong, who is still very much alive and became a director of the Child Light Power Company later. Y.C. was the chairman of the Cotton Spinners Association, and before 48, they realized that they were going to lose everything, and they were looking at Brazil, and they were looking at Mauritius and other places, and he contacted my father and said, will you give us electricity if we come to Hong Kong? To which my father said, definitely. It was a hollow promise. There was no turbines, there were no boilers. However, with Metropolitan Vickers and a long association of some 60 years, he was able to persuade them to divert one turbine of the two going to South Africa to come to Hong Kong, and they did get their electricity when they came here. And that, incidentally, was a turning point for Hong Kong because it brought manufacturing here, which brought people jobs, and they were able, in fact, to make a living here, and Hong Kong prospered. We found two and a half million people here by the 50s. Huge numbers of refugees came into Hong Kong, and here's where my little memory comes in. I remember the squatter fires, and I also remember the hillsides, which were barren with no trees. I remember no vehicles. I remember walking down outside the Peninsula Hotel and seeing trees all the way down Nathan Road. I also remember well, and I know many of you here do, Statue Square where you could park your car easily. Mm -hmm. There were short buildings. They were not tall. They were three stories, four stories. They were imposing colonial edifices. People were dynamic. We were blessed by the fact that we were here. Chinese people have a very similar background of 5,000 years of history, and they are very focused on family, and they are very work-focused. This is something which, of course, Jewish people share. So in many, many ways, this comfort factor was here. There was no anti-Semitism, per se. There was, might I say, earlier uh, in the pre-war days. There might have been a little bit when Hong Kong got back on its feet, but not in any, uh, in any degree on the levels that were experienced in other places. People got on if they Work, wanted to work, they could. Well, these fires meant the government had to act. And in those days, thank goodness, the government did act. Um, I can't say they do very much acting now. But they certainly did then. And, of course, refugee high-rises were built near the airport. And eventually Hong Kong prospered. A new airport was built. Tourism was taken up in high levels with many coming from America by sea. They spent a week or two weeks here. They came with huge trunks. In fact, if you looked at the footprint of a penins typical peninsula room at that point, there was a huge box room for these trunks. And there was usually a little room nearby in case you brought your staff with you. That was the immediate post-war uh, era. Well, we'll fast forward again, because I know you want to ask a few questions, or others may. Uh, we move to the um, 
period of the Korean War, which also had a huge impact on Hong Kong. We move forward now uh, to uh, Hong Kong, which is looking to the future, 15, 16 years out to the transfer of sovereignty. It's interesting to note that Maggie Thatcher, in her chat with Deng Xiaoping, really believed Hong Kong could remain a British sovereign colony. And she was prepared at the time to, in fact, uh, look in terms of long leases uh, using Hong Kong and the new territories as reopeners. Well, that didn't come to pass. But if, even then, there was talk of it. We were privileged to be involved in the largest coal-fired power station in the world, Castle Peak A, in the Western world, Castle Peak A and B. Uh, this was really through the thoughts of my father in that he wanted Britain to feel Hong Kong would remain useful through the transition period. And Hong Kong and China being interested in Hong Kong too would help provide security for Hong Kong's continuity. We had had dealings with China for many years. In 1937, he had hoped to bring electricity to Canton, and it was only the event of World War II which stopped this. In, 19, in 1972, we already had strung a line and were supplying China. So we already had a big um, rapport with the Chinese authorities in the electricity business. We didn't, in fact, have uh, the fear because we had the understanding and the window knowing that the Chinese wished Hong Kong to continue. However, many here didn't have that opportunity to understand it, and they were worried. And, uh, of course, the talks didn't help. Uh, we had, uh, towards the end, Mr. Patton, whose agenda was more uh, the thoughts of treating China as the opposition party rather than engendering or fostering some comfortable uh, through train, which it was called, um, to help. Uh, in terms of confidence here. Many, and we were the fortunate ones who had passports, this was not a, uh, an issue. But for many, their lives were totally disrupted with people going, uh, fathers going to Australia or Canada to get passports, etc. Uh, we had some eye-openers at the time, some rather peculiar ones. I think many of you who lived in Hong Kong at that time will remember that one of China's fears was that Britain would raid the coffers and take all the money back to England in 1997. So a system, and, and Hong Kong made its money selling land, a system of uh, 50 hectares of land was made available every year and no more, so that they, they couldn't sell more and pocket more money in the coffers here. Actually, Britain was very honorable, and they did not, in fact, send any money back. And China has honored her obligations here admirably. But there came a point where we were building the power station uh, at Black Point, which was a very large gas-fired power station. The land needed to be part and parcel of all the negotiations and Britain and China went loggerheads over Hong Kong, nobody was talking and somebody came to see my father. All this would have fallen through in December, at the end of uh, uh, the year and everything would have had to have been negotiated in terms of money, in terms of credit, in terms of being able to obtain the equipment and we didn't have the land. And someone came to my father and said, look, if you want, you can send a message up to China and we can try and sort this out. Now, this was rather 
an undiplomatic thing to do, but we did this. To which we got a message back three days later saying, we will take the land out of the allotment for next year and you'll have the land, go ahead with it. And, and they signed on trust. Of course, both the British um, here, the, the government were not very happy with the fact that we were able to communicate and they weren't. But these were the things that went on at that period, at that time. What are my recollections? Well, my recollections was living in a very dynamic city uh, I lived on Kaduri Avenue. I uh, remember going to school here at Kowloon Junior School. Uh, I remember the typhoons. I remember the fact that the roads got, uh, um, were filled with water and the drains never drained. I remember the uh, funeral services, which would take up the whole of the main street with, if you were prosperous, two or three bands. Uh, and uh, Chinese opera down the center of the street. Uh, I'm sure you'll all remember this as well. Uh, I remember difficulties, uh, reversals. I remember going off to boarding school, as Philip is done now in Switzerland. Um, and, but I remember a very closely knit and united family, and a simple family. Family life for me was one which was really of very, the elements, the values, and parents who were very loving and really cared for their children more than socializing and other things. They did socialize, of course, they had parties, but it was a tight-knit family unit. Um, I'm delighted to have seen Hong Kong prosper. I'm delighted that we still take our place in the world and that we are people who are admired for being flexible enough to be able to ride the difficulties and the, and the heights. And I think that's the dynamism of the people here of Hong Kong. And I feel it a privilege living here. So that's perhaps all I'm going to say. Uh, have I stayed with it in some reason? father felt that he'd lost his youth to his father. Did you ever feel any element that you'd lost your youth to the Kaduri legacy, that there were no options for you but to enter the, the, the Kaduri business? Never, no. My, there was 42 years between my father and me, so he could have been a grandfather to me. Um, no. Uh, in fact, in the beginning, I think my father had absolutely no faith in me, whatever. Uh, when asked, what is he doing? I don't know, why don't you go and see him? So he's only asked, uh, or confidence. But um, I suspect being somewhat of a fixture in the office, eventually I became a little more than a desk and a chair. And he realized there was a little more going on than, than, than he thought. No, I didn't feel so. The privileges come with the obligations, and I've had extraordinary privileges. Uh, <coughs> my father never had those privileges. He lived through a, a scene where not only did he support his father, but then the war years came, he was incarcerated for some uh, four and a half years with a, a young wife, with my mother, and uh, so he lost all of that, but in many ways he was very fortunate. I think if asked, he would say probably uh, the time that he was most productive was after he was 65 or 70. I'm just growing into the productive stage. <laughs> <laughs> Your whole family has been very, very focused on uh, philanthropic works also. Um, there's the Kadri Farm here in Hong Kong that's advanced agricultural development in Hong Kong. There are two very important agricultural schools in Israel. Um, one of the most uh, uh, um, famous graduates from one of the agricultural schools in Israel is Yitzhak Rabin. 
uh, shaped the whole of Israel. Has it, was that very much a part of the focus on your family, that it was important to do things for society in general, um, that it was important to, to share and encourage um, wealth and development amongst those who, who, weren't, who didn't have it quite so readily available? Sharon, I think uh, it is in each and every one that. That obligation is for all of us. To what extent is relative? Uh, I know many, many people here who have shared in that and given of themselves, of their time, of their money, and so on. I don't think it was any different for my family. Um, I think possibly it came more via illustration than it did by do this or do that. Um, in 1925, my grandfather, in fact, Betty and I have just been in Israel now, my, my, my grandfather paid a visit not only to Palestine, but to uh, uh, Turkey, and uh, we've both seen uh, schools in, in, on both sides, in Tulkarim on the West Bank, and in terms of um, of the Mount Tabor School, where, of course, uh, um, you refer uh, in Israel, and in Turkey, a, a hospital. All of these things must have been seen by my father and uncle, who continued it where the needs were. Uh, I, as a, a child, used to go out to our home in the New Territories, often driven by my uncle, who would stop in all these little areas. Remember, these people were refugees. Um, it wasn't considered charity. It was considered really to help people to, 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 to help themselves. Uh, the idea was to give a fishing rod. The recipient did the fishing. Nobody wants charity. In fact, in my, my um, uncle's, I told you there was only one account, Horace would put down personal expenses. He never put charity down. And my father had a wicked sense of humor, and he'd say, Horace, you keep an extremely expensive woman. To which <laughs> my uncle, who was a, a Mother Teresa, in terms of how he, he, he was and felt, he was always, he blushed terribly, of course, I'd walk the laugh. No, it was part and parcel, I think, as part of all of our lives. We're all involved in humanity in one form or another, and it was... Uh, it was never an obligation, it was something which was natural. And I think if I can but pass on only one thing to the next generation, my children, is very simply that this is something that is part of life. If you're privileged to be able to be involved in it, it's the most wonderful thing in the world. Uh, if I may, I'm going to um, uh, ask, uh, see if anybody would like to ask any questions so that we, we can spend the next five or ten minutes in questions. Uh, uh, perhaps later, Nigel. Thank you. Uh, there's a gentleman over there asking a question. Uh, uh, what kind of gentleman is that? Professor's why? Uh, I'm curious, in terms to a less glorious part of, for your family, actually, in terms of opium, uh, your family was, was known not to be involved. Um, the Sassoons were involved. And I wonder, as you grew up and as the families look back upon the involvement with China, um, whether that was an issue that was ever discussed, um, and whether it was something that people thought very much about. Because, I mean, when I talk about your family to my Chinese friends, I always say with pride that the Kaduri family was not involved, and, and unfortunately, the system um, I can't answer you there because nobody has ever touched on the subject with me. I can only surmise that, um, they, that, that, that my grandfather spent so little time with the, uh, with the Sassoon uh, warehouses or the Sassoons, because he went out on his own pretty much immediately. Ellie, uh, Sir Ellis was involved in the hotel company in racing. He had, uh, he did well and he had a, a stable called the Chieftain Stable. And he had other interests, but it was never in trading interests. So, I really can't tell you much about that. I'm delighted, of course, that they didn't have any involvement. <laughs> yes. 
can please uh, tell us a little bit the involvement of your family with the synagogue, especially that we're here at uh, the JCC uh, the, uh, since the early 1900s? Well, the Gabi family were my mother's side, and David Gubby uh, was, in fact, a lay preacher in some ways. Um, that's my mother's father, my grandfather on my mother's side, uh, a chaplain. And um, his involvement here, plus other sides and other members of the family, and I think Judy is in a far better position to tell you about this because she's done the research and I haven't, uh, were some of the founding members of the Jewish community and therefore had involvement, obviously, with the synagogue and, of course, with the burial grounds. Uh, Sally Gabi, my mother, my grandmother, is in fact inscribed on the wall of the synagogue in Marvel. But I think there was a genuine need to provide for the religious here and the family were in a position to assist and help, and so they did get involved. Similarly, in might I say in Shanghai. And might I also add, members of the family in Calcutta were involved. There's a David Gubby there who was involved. There are Sassoons there involved in the three synagogues there in Calcutta. I can't tell you regarding Bombay, but you'll see that type of influence from prominent families in virtually all the synagogues. Is that right? Same families. Yeah. Same families. Yes. You've heard a lot about. I've heard a lot about the men in the Kaduri family, but I've always been intrigued about the fact that there were a few powerhouse women in the Sassoon Kaduri clan, specifically those who were capable of interviewing rabbis and with their erudition, challenging or giving these rabbis a run for their mitzvot or Talmud in terms of the erudition that they, that the, the, the mothers or grandmother or your great-grandmother had vis-a-vis -vis the candidates who were seeking to be in the employ of the Qadaris and the Sassan, specifically to be part of the family that was, were teachers and, uh, and the, the rabbinic element in, in the light as they made the trip from Baghdad to India to to Asia. So can you perhaps recall any stories you heard about your great-grandmother? I can't. Great-grandmother? My God, no. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you, though, that women in those days uh, were, certainly if they'd come from Europe, were well-educated. My grandfather, incidentally, provided the first school for women in the <coughs> Middle East uh, in the name of uh, his his wife who had passed on, and that's still there in 1922, Laura Kaduri uh, School in, 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 in uh, Israel. But Flora Sassoon was very well known in Bombay. She was a pillar of society there, and she may well have had some influence on rabbis. I'm, I'm quite sure she might have. Um, as to whether my grandmother had any influence, I can't tell you. Great grandmother is way beyond me. I'm afraid you'll have to ask up there and some of my responses. Any other questions, ladies and gentlemen? Yeah. Yes, so I'm interested in your uh, family's connection with India. How long did it last, and are there any still there? Are there none there? No. Um, the family interest in India was primarily through the Sassoons and the two brothers who remained. As to what happened to them, I'm afraid I can't tell you. But they did work for the Sassoons there. As to the extended family, or the Sassoons, of which were related on both sides, as they, in fact, uh, prospered, they duly immigrated to Europe, to England particularly. And you've got, uh, you've got Philip, Sir Philip Sassoon, who was one of the founders of the Royal Air Force giving them some aeroplanes. You've got the poet Siegfried Sassoon. You have the Chumleys. They married into aristocracy simply in that they had money and the aristocracy didn't. <laughs> so it's a similar manner to the Americans marrying into the, into the British family. So you still have 
um, you know, Sassoon's intermarried. The last Sassoon in this part of the world was Sir Victor. And he was a bachelor. He eventually married his, his nurse, I think in his late 80s. But he washed his hands off China uh, immediately after the war and established himself in the Bahamas. What was her name, Betty? Ba Barnsley was, the, was the, the last lady in his life who has a heart foundation, which is now passed on. Uh, so really, the number of Sassoon's baby, Vida, has something to do with them, I don't know. Um, but the last one in, in, in India would have left from... Yeah, well, they left in, in, 48, in, in 48, in in the partition. Yeah. They either went to Singapore, of uh, which there's some Sassoon's, uh, or they went to the United States or Israel. But they're none there. There are four there. One of them is a complete crook, uh, <laughs> who um, unfortunately is a trustee to the Jewish uh, school, which my grandfather renovated and which was named after him in 1933. It was a school built in 1875. It now, in fact, educates 2,000 students a day in two classes, and I have been trying for some 13 years to rebuild it. Uh, not an insignificant amount of money, but the trustees who are Indian Jews uh, are bent on making apartment buildings and God knows what else. And I've taken legal advice. I've got great friends who are trying to help me, but I haven't succeeded as yet. Still trying, though. Thank you. Jonathan. From what you've said, from what you've said as a child, you were living over in Kaduri Avenue, which I think is in Kowloon, right? Correct. Um, so, how much and what kind of Jewish education did you have, and what kind of Jewish practice did you have growing up? My identity as a Jew is really through my father and mother, who were not practitioners in the sense that they didn't come to the synagogue every day. My father was. Actually, if you want to find out more about him in that capacity, you have to ask Michael, who was a trustee at the time. My father was president of the community for many years. Uh, there was no question of my identity. We didn't eat pork. We don't in the house today. We didn't eat shellfish. Uh, I came to the synagogue on Kippur and, if I, and, and on New Year's Day as well. But we weren't practicing the religion. We were perhaps uh, practicing what is expected of Jews. And hopefully in that area, um, we've been able to, in some ways, in some small measure, being able to have some impact. Ladies and gentlemen, I can hear 150 tummies rumbling, so I'm going to bring matters to a close. Uh, thank you very much indeed for joining us this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a mic. I will thank you all for your patience. <laughs>